Good morning, Mount Olive, and good morning, Church Online. I want to read to you from the Psalms this morning. This is Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And so the Lord who gives us breath, we're going to use that breath to praise him this morning. So let's stand up as we begin our worship together in the name of the true God, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
church, we now make bold profession of our faith with Christians around the world using the words of the Apostles' Creed on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Your spirit strong in me My flesh may fail But my God, you never will I may be weak But your spirit strong in me My flesh may fail But my God, you never will I may be weak But your spirit strong in me may fail, but my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. Church, you may be seated. my mic came on. I just got to time it right a little bit better. But it's so good to be with you. It's just so good to see all of you this morning as we gather and as we worship the one true God and that God who continues to unleash hope. Unleash hope, you'll know, it's the, the name of our spiritual campaign that we're walking through here as a church. And as we're walking through this campaign, we learn how to unleash hope not just in our lives or in our families or our friend groups, but to a bigger audience, to our workplaces, to our communities, and to our nation and to our world. And so each week we've been having a theme as we walk through this campaign. And this week we're in week three, four if you count the kickoff, but we'll say week three. And week three, the theme for this message is refocus on the future, refocus on the future, learning how to take what's here and now, but not so much to worry about that, not to give the anxiousness or the burdens of today, the time and the energy, but focus on the future and what the future can become, not just for you and me, but for those in our lives and really those all over the world. And so to help illustrate refocusing on the future, I brought with me a pair of binoculars. So raise your hand if you've ever used a pair of binoculars before. And if you're watching with us online and you use them, let me know what you like to use them for. So I really like to use binoculars uh, sometimes when I go hunting. You know, I like to kind of sit up in a deer stand or if I'm like walking along a trail and I just pull these out and I start looking around. But here's the thing with binoculars. How many times do you just pull them straight out of the box or you pull them straight out of your pouch, you try to find something like five miles away and it's perfectly in focus, right? Pretty much non, none of the time. So generally, binoculars, either on one of the lenses or they, maybe they have a dial here in the middle, but what you do is you take something you wanna look at. So let's say if I wanted to look at something out in the narthex and I can't see it, but you slowly but surely dial in your focus, and pretty soon something that's really, really far away comes into clear picture, almost as if it's standing right in front of you, right in front of you, clear as crystal. And so that's where the theme, Refocus on the Future, comes from. It's also a pretty common theme in the Bible if you know where and how to look. One of the very first instances in the Bible, and I think that carries a lot of weight for us, is 
the 12 spies being sent into the promised land, and then they come back, and then they bring the reports. 10 out of the 12 don't give a good report, but two that do, two that give a very promising report are Joshua and Caleb. This is the same Joshua that would later go on to be Moses' successor as the leader of Israel. And so what happens, Joshua and Caleb, along with 10 other spies, they get sent into the promised land, they get said, hey, kind of do like a, a recon mission. Go in, spend 40 days, 40 nights there, and let us know what you see, and then bring back word. So as they go and they bring back the word, you know, they go up to Moses and they're like, hey, the promised land is everything that you said it would be, everything that God promised it would be. It's awesome, it's a really great area, except there's a lot of enemy, enemies that already dwell in the land. And we're not talking, you know, we're not talking little pipsqueak enemies, we're talking big bad guys. Cities with fortified walls that we would never be able to break down. There's no way that we can go and get this promised land. That's the report of 10 out of the 12 spies. But you look at Caleb's report in Numbers 13, verse 30. And in for this verse, Caleb is addressing Moses and he's addressing all the people of Israel. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once, right now, and occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. You see, Caleb is not focused on the here and now, how insurmountable or how high the odds may be against them. Caleb's focus is on the future. His focus is on the promise that God laid out for his people so many years ago that said, I will give you the promised land. You will go in, you will occupy, and you will dwell there forever. Caleb's not worried about the here and now. He's focusing on the future. This isn't something that just pops up in the Old Testament. Jesus himself, our Lord and Savior, is nothing but future focus. And you get to hear, and you can really see a good example of that in Acts 1, verse 8. So in this verse, Jesus has already risen from the dead. Amen? Amen. And so he's walking with his disciples. He's talking with them. He's spending time with them. And right before he goes back up to heaven, right before he ascends, he leaves them this promise. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. You see, the disciples were so focused on the here and now, as they should have been. Jesus, their teacher, this great mentor, this great savior who was dead for three days now is alive again. I, don't, I can't speak for you, but if I was a disciple in that day and age, I'm not letting Jesus out of my sight. I'm sticking with him as much as possible. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know that he's back, I know that he's alive, I'm gonna stay right there, I'm gonna do whatever he says. But Jesus, tells them to do something a little different. He doesn't say focus on the here and now, rejoice in the here and now. He says, I've got something bigger planned for you. I've got people all over the world that need to hear about my love and my word and my forgiveness and my mercy. And guess who gets to do that? The disciples. You see, the disciples were focused on here and now in the moment with their risen Lord and Savior, but Jesus says, you are gonna go out and you're gonna bring my name to the very ends of the earth. And we know that the disciples would go on from Jerusalem to go preach in India, North Africa, all across Asia, Rome. The disciples went everywhere because of Jesus's focus on the future. And that really got me thinking, and maybe it's got you thinking while I'm up here talking to you, we don't like to focus on the future too much, do we? And maybe that asks us another question, why don't we focus on the future? You know, 2020 has been, let's just say, an eventful year so far, and it continues to be. There's a lot of things to get done now. There's a lot of things that have happened and have transpired, and there's a lot of things that need to get done 
Now, maybe that's why we don't like to focus on the future is because we are so bogged down and discouraged by the way things already are. You know, it's pretty easy, right? There's a lot of negativity, no matter how far you look, no matter where you look, this world seems to be flooded with negativity in every crevice and corner that we can find. And maybe some of that negativity, maybe it's in our own hearts. Maybe it's in our own minds and souls. You don't have to answer this out loud. You don't even have to nod if you, don't, if you wanna be embarrassed. But how many of us have ever said this statement? Because I'll be honest, I have. I wish I had a better, you fill in the blank. I wish I had a better car. I wish I had a better job. I wish I had a better pension, retirement plan. I wish I had a better marriage. I wish I had a better relationship with my family or my kids. You don't have to answer that out loud, but I'd be willing to bet that a lot of us have said something similar to that at some point in our lives. And so, Church, I wanna tell you a story. And this story is about a little five-year-old named Mike Fox, and he's learning to ride a bike for the very first time. And just as an illustration purpose, we're gonna pretend that this stand is a mailbox. Some of you are already ahead of me, good. So, my dad was teaching me how to ride a bike. He pulled the training wheels off, which is a really big day for a five-year-old, and you know, he's holding onto the back of my bicycle seat, and every time I'm getting a little farther, and then I fall. I get a little further the next time, and then I fall. But my dad, every time, don't worry, I've got you. You're gonna be fine. Just keep pedaling, just keep going forward. Until that one fateful ride, where I finally feel my dad let go, and I'm pedaling like crazy, and I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm standing upright. And you know that, you know that adrenaline dump you get for the first time when you're riding a bike without the training wheels? Well, that hit me. And I was like, oh, oh, this is awesome. Dad, this is great. And in my five-year-old insurmountable wisdom, I turned around. I turned around, the bike is still going forward. I'm facing backward trying to yell at my dad, Dad, look, I'm doing it. Dad, this is awesome, I'm doing it. And I can hear my dad's voice, but I can't make out what he's saying. It, to me, it just sounds like, yeah, yeah. And then, right as I get like, let's just say inches of my fate, I'm still turned around by this point, and I can finally make out what my dad is saying. Turn, turn, smack, boom. Down goes Mike, down goes the mailbox. You know, the, the bike had a little bit of uh, cosmetic damage, but overall, it ended up being a very good day and little five-year-old Mike wouldn't end up riding his bike for another three weeks. So, church, I tell you that story because I wanna ask you this, and this is, now we're gonna get real. Here's the question I wanna ask you. Is there something that you are still focusing on from your past that continues to affect you today? Is there something that happened in your life that was just so monumental that no matter what you seem to do in the day to day, it still finds a way to creep in and influence whatever it is that you're doing. You know, maybe, maybe it's a kind or an unkind word that somebody said to you, and they said it a while ago, but right before you go to bed, you still just can't help but think about it. Maybe it was an unkind word that you said to somebody, and even though you, maybe you've gone to them and maybe you've said, you know, I, I'm sorry, and they've given you forgiveness, they've said, don't worry, I forgive you. You still can't shake your mind you still can't shake that grief and that guilt off of your heart. Maybe it was something a little more big. Maybe it was an unexpected death. Maybe it was an unexpected diagnosis that you got from a routine checkup. But is there something in your life right now that continues to affect what you do today? Maybe it's today. Maybe things aren't really going that well. Maybe the bills keep piling up. Maybe there's something in the here and now that, like we said earlier, is just bogging you down so much 
that you don't even have the mental energy or the willpower to even think about tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. So now, maybe that frames another question for you and me. Why? Why should we focus on the future? Why should we focus on the future when today has enough troubles of its own? Well, church, I want us to read the statement why we should focus on the future. If you can read it, I invite you to do so, but it's, print, it's printed up here on the screen. Why should we focus on the future? We stop seeing things as they are to what they can become. When we stop focusing and stop giving mental and spiritual energy into how bad things may be right now, and instead we shift that and we take that and focus on the future, a limitless world of possibilities opens up for you, for me, and for everybody else in our lives. You see, this is something that Jesus did. This is something that Jesus did with his disciples because when we look at the disciples at a face value, they really weren't the cream of the crop among society. They really weren't the best people with the best reputations. They were loud mouths and hotheads who would spur off at the spur of a moment. St. Peter. They were really analytical numbers guys who didn't want to do anything unless it made sense financially. Well, that's St. Matthew. Thomas doubted. James and John, the, the sons of thunder, let me just put it this way. Sons of thunder might sound like a cool nickname, but it is not a reputation that you wanted in first century Israel. You see, Jesus didn't focus on who the disciples were like. He didn't focus on their habits. He knew them. He knew the disciples inwards and outwards, backwards and forwards. He knew everything about them. But instead, he focused on what these men, these fishermen, this tax collector, this ragtag group of people in Israel, he focused on what they could become. He focused on these men, and in all of their flaws, they had faith. They had faith in Christ, and in, in that faith, Jesus then grows a focus for the future, a focus for his love, for his gospel, for his ministry that would be carried out through the hands and feet of people who you and I would never think would do anything even close to what these disciples did. We read in Matthew 6. Matthew 6 is Jesus's, it's like right in the middle of Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is probably one of the most uh, recognized passages in the Bible because it's Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. In this one sermon, we could probably preach like 30 different sermons, but I want you to look at Matthew 6. And this is Matthew 6, 26 and 27. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? If you're curious about the answer, yes, you are far more valuable than just some birds in the air. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Well, hold on, Pastor Mike. You've just been saying we need to focus on the future. We need to look at all the future possibilities. But Jesus is saying, don't worry about it. Yes and yes. You see, you and I are not called to worry about the future. You and I are called to focus on the future. You can do both. You can focus on the future and not worry about it because ultimately, worrying about the future, there's not a lot to worry about when it comes to eternal future. Yes, tomorrow, today and tomorrow will have the troubles of their own, but our ultimate future, our eternal residence has been taken care of and it's still taken care of today because Jesus Christ died for you, for me, and for the entire world. And that's not something that goes away. That's not something that is contingent on the future. It is something that depends on Christ. And we know that from Christ's word, we know from God's word, Christ always holds up his end of the bargain. He always 
holds true and fulfills his promises. If you are curious about our, our sermon series, Unleashing Hope, the book that we're doing it and we're modeling it after is called The Hope Quotient, and it's by a pastor, Ray Johnston. And in this book, there's a, there's a, there's a bit in the, bo in the book where he talks about a conversation he had with one of his friends. And his friend comes to him and he says, you know, life is good, but my relationship with my stepson is kind of on the rocks. And there's not a lot that I can do right in his eyes, it seems like. And so Pastor Ray Johnston tells his friend, if you stop focusing on who your son is and focus on what he becomes or what he can become, then that's gonna change the relationship for the better for the both of you. And then his friend called him about a month later and he said, hey, you know, he's, uh, he's still not volunteering to do all of his chores. He still uh, breaks curfew every now and then. But the way that we look at each other and the way that we interact with each other, something has changed. Something has changed for the better. Because when we shift our focus from the is to what can become, we experience a lot of benefits. And these are five that are laid out. So what are the benefits of refocusing on the future? Benefit number one, passion replaces apathy and discouragement. It's so easy to get discouraged by the way things are. It's so easy to be apathetic or unmotivated or discouraged because of how fallen this world really is and how broken we really are. But when we are focused on the future and we are focused on what things can be, whether it's in our, our personal lives, whether it's in our professional lives, then we're filled with passion because we're not worried about the here and now. We're not focusing on the negatives of today, we're focusing on the positives of tomorrow. So that's benefit number one. Benefit number two, we experience great comebacks. You know, when the world knocks us down in the day to day, and it will, and it probably still is, we become more resilient. We become resilient because no matter what happens today, the future, while you know the small details may not be promised or guaranteed, the ultimate future, the eternal future, has been promised and is still promised. And we learn how to bounce back and we learn how to take what we've learned and apply it for the future. Benefit number three, grace frees us and our future vision fuels us. I wanna read to you from Philippians 3, this is uh, verses 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, these are the words of the Apostle Paul, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press onward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. If there was anybody who had every right to be sorrowful and mourn and not let himself off the hook for the things of his past, it was Paul. He persecuted the church. He drove people out of their homes. He'd scattered the early Christian church. He persecuted and killed a lot of early Christians. But Paul says, I forget all that because God has called me to something much larger and much greater for the future. And that vision and that grace fueled Paul throughout his whole ministry as he continued to bring the good news and write those letters everywhere he went. Benefit number four, you and I are free to dream. We're free to dream because throughout scripture, you'll constantly read, with God all things are possible. Nothing is impossible for God. God will be with you wherever you go. And when we focus on the future, when we really invest in the future and what that means for you and me, we're free to dream because we know that there is nothing that God can't do through us and for us. And somehow, some way, by his grace, we will be exactly who he has called us to be. Benefit number five, forward momentum stabilizes and energizes us. So remember the story, Little Mike on a Bike? That could be a kid's book. Think about this. Have you ever tried to ride a bike as slow as possible? 
What happens when you're going slower? You get a little more wobbly. It's easier to stay balanced on a bicycle that's going fast because that bicycle is designed to be ridden at various speeds, but at those speeds, it's designed to balance itself out. It's designed to take care and stabilize and keep going forward. And that's what our focus on the future does because if we, when we're slow, you know, and things are kind of unshaky and wobbly, focus on the future pushes and drives us toward that future, that calling that God has put in for you and for me and for the entire world, but it gives us the energy to keep going forward, to approach tomorrow with a positive mentality and a positive mindset. And it energizes us because as we move forward in this life and in our various lives and our various roles that God has put us in, we get to continue to unleash hope. We get to continue to unleash hope to everybody in our lives and to everybody around the world. And that happens when we focus on the future. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today. We give you thanks for the many blessings that you pour into our lives. We give you thanks for a glimpse of your power displayed in creation, in the changing of the seasons and the temperatures starting to cool off. And Lord, we give you thanks today that you, you focus on what we can become and you died for who we are. You died for us that we, while still in our sin, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to the cross for us, to pay the price, to pay the ransom for our sin, to call us back to you. And Lord, we pray that you continue to flood your Holy Spirit, to flood our church, to flood our nation and our world, and that you continue to call all people to you. And Lord, we pray that you make us your hands and your feet as we continue to live out the gospel that you have called us to do. Lord, we pray that as we focus on the future, you be with us every single step of the way because you promise that wherever we are, you will be with us wherever we go. Lord, it's this prayer, the prayers that we speak in our hearts, we cast them all on you, knowing that you hear, love, and sustain us. And all God's people said, amen. Church, this is normally the time where we would collect and prepare our offerings. If you have your offerings with you, you are free to do so, and we you can drop it off in the offering baskets on your way out. We also have multiple ways to give, either electronically, or you can go on our Mount Olive website, and you can sign up for electronic giving, but there are ways to continue to give to support the mission and the ministry here at Mount Olive. We also wanna encourage you to stay with us in our Monday through Friday daily devotions at 9 a.m. as we continue to walk through and unleash hope and dig into this sermon series. And those, if you don't do Facebook, they get put up on YouTube a little bit later in the day. So even if you can't join us in person, you can always access that later. We also still have tickets for our 2013 Camaro. And I think, uh, I think nature is getting a little jealous of it because I'm starting to see a lot more orange throughout the trees. And it's starting to pretty much look like that Inferno Orange on the Camaro. But tickets are $25, we still have a lot of them. All the benefits from that will go to uh, fund the various youth and action ministries we have here at Mount Olive. So if that's something you'd like to do, please talk to me or anybody else on the church staff for tickets and availability. With that, we prepare our hearts and minds to receive the body and blood of Jesus. Church, as we prepare to receive Holy Communion, we start by praying the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples and as he teaches us today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just as we are invited to partake in Christ's body and blood and receive forgiveness, we're also called to repent and confess our sins, both now and in the past. But Jesus also calls us that we don't have to be hung up. We are not creatures of the past. We're not creatures of the now. We are creatures. We are children of God. Children of God that he died and shed his blood for. So as we come forward, we confess that we are unworthy, but we receive forgiveness, divine and forgiveness that only comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This cup is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now church, may the peace of the Lord be with you always. The table of the Lord is ready.
with me
Have a blessed week in the Lord and continue to unleash hope no matter where you go. God's peace, and we'll see you later. Amen.